I'm your host, Mandy McMillan, and today I'm pleased to have with us Local 3's Director of Organizing, John Curtin. John, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. John is going to talk a little bit today about organizing as it relates to the union, um, the importance of organizing gains, what an organizer does, and just shed some light on organizing in a construction union. But before we get into that, John, can you give us a little bit of background on you, you know, how you started in the field, when you joined Operating Engineers, and then how you made this career transition into being the director of the organizing department for one of the largest construction trades locals in the United States. Sure can. So I started, I don't know exactly what year it was, but I started out and I joined the laborers union. A friend of mine was in the laborers union and kind of talked me into doing something different uh, with my life. And although I was in sales and doing some other things, um, he was telling me about the benefits that he was getting. Not only that, but the money that he was making was obviously better than what I was doing. So I jumped in uh, with both feet to join the laborers union. Um, and glad I did. I learned a lot about the industry and how job sites work, um, you know, I, as a laborer. And worked there for about, I think it was a little over five years or so, right in there. And then through that whole time, I always wanted to you know, be that guy up there on the excavator. And, you know, I sat there and watched this guy dig for for years, and now I wanted to be that guy. So made a turn and wanted to be an operator and jo joined the Local 3 and um, started out with, you know, running several different things, you know, backhoes and excavators and things like that. And then as the years went on, saw a little bit different capacity as far as working directly for the union and then one of the jobs came up as an organizer, and I applied for it. And sure enough, I mean, here, here I am, and now five years later, as my predecessor, though, um, you know, Bruce Knoll was the director of organizing before me. And then when he was uh, promoted, uh, they had asked me to take the position, and, and I accepted, and so here I am today. So starting out as a laborer, um, that's not always the career path that kids are led to. I mean, you're supposed to go to college, you're supposed to get a four-year degree, but you had the foresight as a younger person to think about retirement and pension. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, so not not every kid wants to go to college, right? And not every kid wants is great in school and all that kind of stuff and doesn't want to do all that kind of stuff. I think I was right on the fence of wanting to do a little bit of college and trying to figure out what path I wanted to do. But I saw the benefits in the union as far as retirement and things that they offered as far as health care. And as you get um, older and um, in those capacities, you want to know what you're going to do for yourself or how they can help you and the rest of you know your life. And so I saw that those benefits, the writing was on the wall as far as you know, pension, you know, health and welfare for yourself or, and even at that time, you know, wanting to start a family, um, you have to look at all of those things for sure. So John, what does a local three organizer do? Um, a lot of our listeners might have no clue and know it's not, you know, straightening out your desk. What does a normal day look like for an organizer? Well, a normal day is usually getting up uh, before the chickens are up. Absolutely. They're out there wanting to talk to the hands before they actually get out to work. And some of the things that we do out there are going out and going talking to those hands because we want to find out who the best of the best is out there. And if they're not with the union yet, then maybe we can offer offer them some opportunity. So they're, they're out there first thing in the morning going out and talking with people, and then the rest of their day usually ends up um, with going to go find that contractor that may be a non-union contractor. And we go and we build a relationship with them and we start talking with them about the benefits of the union and how we can help them grow. And there's lots of, there's several different things that we can do to, you know, help them grow. Typically why a, a contractor comes to us or, or we start chatting with them is because they want to grow and they don't know how. And they're also tired of putting ads on, you know, whether it's Indeed Craigslist. or Craigslist or, yeah, or something like that. And they'll have to do several you know, months of training for that individual to, you know, run that tractor, whether it be, you know, a backhoe or an excavator or something like that, where we have those people, they're already skilled and trained and we have those, those folks. 
And so we can teach them about the benefits of being able to utilize our people when you need them and then when you not when you don't need them so much. So there might be a new job coming up where they need 10 people and or 10 operators and they don't know how they're going to man this job, right? And so they call us and they want to know how they how they can do that and get those folks out to work for them and we teach them how to do that. So sometimes you you're in the position of them contacting you, but a lot of times it's you seeking out these top hands or, you know, this new company in town. Um, in that way, organizing is similar to sales. You said you had a little bit of a background in sales. Can you explain that? Yeah. So I, I, I did have some, some sales experience, um, out of high school. I worked for a company out in Nevada, um, that I did a lot of that stuff, uh, with. And, and I think a, a little bit of that, um, you know, obviously helps on knowing how to talk to people, and 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 get through to them on on what their what their needs are and being able to sell your you know your goods to them right. So when they when they come to us, um, we're going to sell them on you know the union on local three is what we're going to do. We're going to teach them everything that they need to know about us and how we can how, how we can help them. And what's cool for you is you're not just selling a product; you're selling uh, something that you're personally very passionate about because it's given you a livelihood. Like you've seen the benefits of your life and having joined local three and, and what it's done for families, members, contractors. So it's more than just a product. It's a, it's a career path. It's uh, a retirement. It's growing your business. Yeah, so when you go to them, it's, it's very personal. Yeah, absolutely. And you can watch those, you know, those things grow with a, with a company as, you know, as we have in the past, we've taken, you know, several companies and watched them grow into, into doing, you know, two and three and four times the business that they were doing and the membership that they, the people that they get from the membership, um, being able to see them help that contractor be successful and those guys being, um, you know, super happy about what they're doing. All these operators love what they do. They love running tractors every single day. Now, and when you organize a company and the members become union members as well, aren't they then also happier employees? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, you know, we talk with, you know, several different what we call non-union uh, employees, you know, every day and depending on, you know, what they're doing and, and uh, what job that they're working at and if they want to change in their career. And it's usually typically not a, not a hard sale because, some of the employers out there are not paying the scale that the union, you know, is. And so when we talk about, you know, that top hand that's out there working that may be making a lesser wage than, than the union wage, then it's a pretty easy sale in that capacity for sure. Being able to put that person to work, you know, right away. Now there's a level of being uninformed in general about, about unions. Sure. Um, that's, there's a public theory that unions are bad or that unions are going to cost your money or that the union's going to come in and tell you how to run your job, you right. run your business. Um, it's too expensive. You're not going to make any money. Can you talk a little bit about how that is misinformation and um, it, it, consider me a contractor who's really hesitant, you know, I'm not going to do it. No way. You know, get out of my front door. What do you say to me to make me see the light? So we talk about, um, first of all, we need to do some research and we need to find out what that contractor is actually doing and we didn't know there's 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 several different capacities of construction right there's dirt moving right there's just simply excavating there's paving there's all those types of things and we can help them grow in all of those you know capacities so we would tell them how we can help them grow and as far as gathering the people that they need at the certain times and the skilled people that they need you know, for instance, a paver, you can't just go out and go find anybody that can run that paving machine. That paving machine is, is very hard to run. And if you're not good at it, the company does not want you. So we have those skilled people to be able to tell that contractor, look, we have got that guy. You need that guy to run that paver. I have one or two or three or maybe four of them that you can have. And you've developed those relationships with those employees, right? Through, through the districts, like, you know, the, the operators that can do that work and do it well. Oh, absolutely. So each district typically knows uh, the guys that are, are out there that are doing the work that can, that can make that, that happen. And if they're on the out of work list or something like that, we can, we can be able to, to pull them off the out of work list and put them in the right capacity to make that, 
company do what they need to do, whether it be paving or excavating or possibly digging that, excavating that hole that's 20 foot deep that not everyone can do. It takes a lot of skill to, you know, take an excavator and go dig that 20 foot trench to be able to put that pipe in. Not everyone can do that. We have those people. So when you organize a company, um, that is that what's considered this phrase top down organizing? Yes. So top down. Yeah. We start from the top. It sounds just like it is. Um, so you start at the employer who is either the, you know, the president. And so you go right to him is where you want to go. Um, you might have to make some other relationships on getting there and how you get there. Right. Cause not always does the owners of companies want to, uh, you know, talk to, to the average Joe every day and they don't really know who you are and they don't know what you want. That's, you want. that's the sales kind of cold call. Sure. Hey, I'm coming in. Yeah, Do you so have time you, for me? Right. So, so you go in there, you build a relationship if you have to with somebody else and then being able to get to where you need to be, which is, uh, that president of that company, the owner, you know, or something. And then we start explaining to them the benefits of of Local 3 and how we can help them. And there are there are many stories, I'm sure, of companies that were perhaps hesitant. You sign them up, and then they're, they've grown. Their, their market share has increased. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, a specific, a positive story where that was the case? Sure. I mean, we've had, I don't want to mention, you know, all the contractors out there. There's several of them, right? Um, but yeah, there's several cases out there where we've taken a company that has had, you know, between two and four guys or something like that. And then we've tripled their business on them calling us and looking at us and going, hey, I've got this upcoming job and I don't know how to man it. And I've got 10 more people. But if I, if I don't do it, I'm going to miss out on this job. Like I don't, I don't have the people. So I can't bid on this work. So if I can take 10 guys from you and be able to man this job, well, that's fantastic. So then he does that. We sign him up, right? He takes the 10 people and he does that. And then he looks at more opportunity and goes, there's another job down the street that's, you know, X amount. And we want to do that job too. But I still don't have enough people. Well, you can still call us and we still have the people, you know. So we've seen those companies uh, grow time and time again. We, I mean, we do it every day. There's companies out there that uh, all, all over, you know, Northern California from Fresno all the way to, to the Oregon border that, you know, we could talk about all day. The success stories where success companies stories, have grown. Absolutely. We talked about top down organizing, bottom up organizing is the reverse of that, right? So it's like when a unit specifically wants to be organized. You have to go in there and talk with the empl employees is who you talk to. And whether they want to take and make that company a union company, there's a whole process through the uh, National Labor Relations Board the, uh, process that you have to go through to be able to do that. It's not a it's not an easy process, and it it takes time, you know, and it takes building uh, relationships for sure. That trust, and then and you, you're you have a lot of obstacles to overcome. A lot of companies hire people to. Uh, strong arm the employees into not doing that. The, yeah, the term union busting is real and exists today, correct? It, it, yeah. it is absolutely for sure. And it, and it does exist. And uh, we recently did have that happen to us. And we tried to bottom up a company um, down in the San Jose area where they hired uh, folks to come in there and badmouth the union to the employees. And so then the employees listen to them and we're trying to, you know, go back and forth and teach them, you know, that that's not right. And what they're telling you is not true. Um, and then being able to have an election and then the employees decide all of that stuff because it, it comes from the employees, not the employer side. Now you have, um, a staff of about how many explain sort of the jurisdiction that your organizers operate sure. in. Sure. Operate in. So we local three covers, um, in, in California, we cover from the Kern County line all the way to the Oregon border. And in California, we have got nine organizers across the state and then we've got one researcher that is in Sacramento full time and those guys go out like we talked about earlier about hitting it early every single day and making building relationships and whatnot every day what is it that you tell them you send them all a text in the morning that says what <laughs> if you're not pissing excellence and go back home yeah, <laughs> so yeah and then I've got additionally we've got one um, full time uh, organizer in Hawaii that covers all the islands in Hawaii and then we have one that covers all of Northern Nevada, which is uh, Northern Nevada is Local 3's district. And then the, all of Utah, the whole state of Utah, 
one guy that covers the whole state, and that's all of our jurisdiction as well. Those guys put on the miles. They put the miles on their they cars. It's, uh, it's pretty far to go from Reno to somewhere like Elko or or out to Ely, Nevada, you know, places like that. In, uh, you know, in Utah, driving all the way down to St. George to go do work and go find new contractors and things, it's a pretty long haul. And they, um, it's not easy, right? I mean, they're told no, they're told to get out, they're told to go away. Um, they're out there like binoculars, like looking at jobs from far away, getting intel. I mean, I've spent some time with a few organizers back in the day, but what, um, I guess tenacity is something that yeah, they mean, need per, to have per, it's perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. Per, it's persistence. Yeah. And, and it's persistent. I mean, we just got to go back every time and we no no one likes the answer. No, of course. Right. But, uh, but we're not going to quit trying. And then we also need to study that company and find out what direction they're moving in. Are they still uh, going to be working in the same capacity? Are they still doing that same type of work or are they going to change directions and do some other type of work? And if they're going to do the other type of work, maybe we have some other people that we can offer them or another angle. Yeah. I mean, are they going to stay around here? Are they just here for the short term? We mentioned organizing a lot. Um, I know business manager Dan Redding and his semi-annual speeches goes into the organizing numbers and, and how successful you are. Why is organizing so important to local three? Well, it's about the membership and it's about creating job opportunities and more market share uh, for our for our members so that when they are looking for that next company that we create, you know, more of those. And if we're out there organizing and signing up those, you know, companies every day that there's obviously more market share there. Right. And then that creates opportunity for them to be able to look at, you know, some other company and go to work for them. Um, people change companies all the time and whatnot and go here and go there. So if we have more of that market share out there, it's creating more opportunity for our members. Now, for the non-union skilled operator who is just afraid, afraid to join Local 3, what do you tell him or her? And, you know, why are they so hesitant at the beginning? So usually they're so hesitant because it's change. Um, and... You know, we, we try to help, you know, the process of, of that change. And now they're going to be a member of, of a union and they don't know, really know how it goes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we try to tell them all of the capacities about, you know, changing and how it's going to be better for them because they're going to get benefits for their family. They're going to typically usually get um, more, you know, maybe a pay increase or something like that. And being able to stay local with where they're at you know, sometimes maybe they're traveling, you know, a long ways to go to work and maybe they need some change. Well, the way our system works is that you can apply for, for work in different areas of where you live. You know, so if, if there's work up in, you know, Reading and you're living down in Stockton, that's really not, a, you know, a place to go, right? Or a commute you want to do. So we'd be able to teach them how to apply for the out of work list and be able to only get those jobs that are maybe close to home and so that they have a better quality of life as well. And when you, when you do educate them on the benefits and, and they do decide to join, um, can you recall a memory or, you know, of maybe talking to someone who was like, Oh my God, I'm so glad that I did this. This changed my life because that is what you're doing. Yes. I, I honestly still get the first guy that I organized when I came on staff, I stole a uh, a crane hand from another non union company, and he was he was looking to go to work at for somewhere else anyway, and so when he came to us, I put him to work somewhere else, and he still calls me every Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, yeah, no, and uh, to to be able to thank me, you know what I mean for for changing his life, and and it was it was life changing for him, you know, and uh, and he's super appreciative of it, and uh, and is very happy where he's at today. Well, and that's why being on the local three staff and doing what you do is so rewarding. Absolutely. You are literally improving yeah. people's lives. Right. Sometimes it's not always about production. And, you know, when you're out in the field and look back and you've, you know, paved that, you know, three miles of paving today or whatever you've done. Um, sometimes it's not always about that. It's about, you know, changing lives, you know, and, and things like that for people. And, and relationships. I mean, you have contractors that you signed who, know who to go to, what to, what to ask for, for what they need. And those relationships continue for years and years and years. Yeah, and that, that is what organizing is 
right at, at the fundamental level, it's building relationship. Absolutely. And whether you whether you sign that contractor today or whether it be 10 years from now, I mean, there's instances in the past where we've uh, been looking at contractors for, you know, more than 15 years. And not that the next guy was the guy, the lucky guy that walked through the door. It's that also the predecessors that went through that door several times years ago, whether it be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or whatever it was, and built that relationship all the way up to that point. And then they finally, you know, see the need for the union. And then you just happen to be the guy that walked through the door that they say, today's my day, I want, I'm ready to sign up and do this. Well, yeah, back up. You said you've been on some organizing drives that have lasted 10, 12, 13 years. I haven't been around that long, for sure, in, in Local in 3. Capacity, right. Yes. But but heard the stories, absolutely, you know, when you're talking with those district reps and whatnot, and they talk about how long that they've been looking at that contractor and what the history is. And that's what you have to find out when you're building those relationships, too, is finding out what the history is on, you know, who went through their door, what was said, and how did things go. You know, you have to know all of that. There's a ton of research that goes on with this before you even walk into a contractor's office. You know, for sure, you don't just walk in there. You know, hi. Hi, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm local so, three. So, yeah. Um, well, you have to be pretty brave and a pretty good communicator. You do. We uh, we get our fair share of no's and get escorted out of offices and job sites and things for sure. And you, um, and you just take so, it and show up the next day and do right. it again. We, we don't take no for an answer. We often share organizing data over a time frame. We talk about master agreements, project agreements, dispatches related to those agreements. Can you break that down? Because that's kind of confusing, I think. The difference between a master agreement and a project agreement first. Sure. So so typically, when we're talking with a new company or a, a prospect uh, company, and they they don't really know what the union is all about, we go there and we try to teach them. And then we tell them that we're going to give them what we call a project agreement. So that is specifically to that project only. It's just like it sounds. And it's only for that one only, and that's it. There's no other jobs that they incorporate with the union. It's only that one job. So for that one job, maybe, they're, maybe they need more hands or maybe they need um, skilled and trained operators for that job. And so we have those folks, and we go, when this job is done, all of those operators are going to go back to their either sign back up on the out of work list and go to another job site, you know, or something like that. Um, the difference between that and the master agreement, the master agreement is being signatory with local three all the time. There, there's definitely a difference. I mean, like I said, it's only a one job versus being it being there all the time. And typically when we do those one jobs, those contractors find out, wow, that was a really great experience. I can call up and get whoever I want, and, you know, I might need something specific. I might need, you know, that excavator hand, like we talked about earlier, that can dig that 20 foot deep. You know, now if I become signatory, I can just do that all the time. Easy access Easy right access now. To the work. So the project the agreement is kind of like your, it's not a free trial, but it's sort of like the trial period, like get your foot in the door, but you use that as an organizing tactic. Sure, we, we use it as a, as a tool, you know, to right, as another, just another tool in the shed to be able to offer them something because not everybody wants to just go and go jump right in with both feet and they want to take us for a test drive and they want us the to, to know, you know, what we're all about and how we do it. So that's kind of our prelude to the master agreement for sure. So when we give those numbers dispatches as a result of these agreements, that's a, a way of gauging, okay, these, these jobs were related specifically to this project right. and you have all of those numbers. Yeah. Dispatches, uh, new members, master agreements signed, you know, things like what, what type of agreements are signed uh, in what districts and that kind of thing. Yeah, we have all those stats. You mentioned um, the project agreement was one of your tools. Um, what is one of the most effective organizing tools you have? So typically one of the, one of the best ones is, is that, you know, a lot of contractors don't know that uh, because they might be misinformed about the union and they, they may not know that they can actually save money with uh, being with Local 3, because if they're out there doing what we call public works jobs, anything that's done with public funds, you know, tax money, that when they're doing that and they're paying that prevailing wage, um, they're they're paying the whole wage and the benefit package to that employee. And so when they're paying all that on that check, they're paying payroll taxes on every last bit of whatever that dollar amount may be, right? And so when they become 
signatory with us and they're still doing that same work and they're doing a lot of it, they can save money on, let's just say, uh, payroll taxes um, on that. So they get a certain wage and then X amount of dollars gets to goes to their fringe benefit package. So they don't have to pay any payroll taxes on that. That's huge. On that, yeah, on, on any of that um, fringe benefit side. So that's, you know, that's one of them for sure. So we've all heard about the labor shortage. A lot of the skilled and trained workforce is retiring or will retire in the next three to five years. What can you say to someone who is skilled and trained in this industry and is interested in possibly joining Local 3? What are the next steps that he or she can take? Because the likelihood of finding a job right now is pretty high, right? So what they really need to do is pick up the phone, call the union hall, and get with an organizer. An organizer will come out and go meet with them face to face and possibly even um, if they're already running you know tractors or they're doing something like that we can go out and go watch and see what their skill level is and be able to maybe possibly you know place them somewhere where they would be needed but as far as the rest of that there's always our website that they can go to that's oe3.org yeah and that even if there's you know somebody who wants to get into the industry that's brand new out there they don't know anything about you know, tractors or anything like that, and they want to get in, we always have our apprenticeship program. And our apprenticeship program is fantastic with all of the tools out there that they have and the the equipment and stuff that they can train on. Um, so what they have to do is go to our website, and then they start there with, with the apprenticeship program. But definitely get a hold of an organizer, and they will chat with you face-to-face on what they need to do and, and what steps it takes. Because there is there. and will be a huge need for these there's, there's skilled and trained. There's, a, there's always a need for sure for, for, for new blood coming in because we've always have, you know, members retiring, right? And if, if we're not uh, out there tracking down those folks, who's taking care, you know, of those, that next generation. So we're always looking for those, uh, what we call new blood, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, COVID has obviously impacted many industries all of us in one way or another, but the construction industry has done fairly well, even even during these times. Um, and given the fact that we've had this infrastructure bill pass recently, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that there's going to be a lot of work for operating engineers for many years. Would you agree? Absolutely. There already is a lot of work. I mean, uh, the last three years have been fantastic for you know the workload. We've been you know super busy, and we often get you know, a a lot of our members out there working. And when the infrastructure bill, you know, passed, there's still a time lapse on when we're actually going to see a lot of those public funds and whatnot come out, which um, is not going to be, you know, right now, and it might be in the, in the short future, you know, maybe by the end of the year, we'll start to see some of those funds and some of those projects come out. Because even when you have that money um, to go out there and go spend, it still doesn't mean you're just going to go out there and go fix a bridge tomorrow. Yeah. Because engineers have to look at things and plan and, and figure out, you know, what they need to do with those type of things to be able to do that. So in in the, in the future, absolutely. There's going to be for the next, I don't know how many years that infrastructure bill is going to help out a lot. So if what I'm hearing, John, um, if you have experience, you should check out our website, oe3.org and get in touch either with the district office or the organizer there. And if you are a company interested in becoming signatory to Local 3, uh, same experience. Absolutely. Um, and there's really no reason on earth why you wouldn't want to become signatory to Local 3. Do you have any parting statements to people who might be on the fence about that? No, I think it's just uh, about uh, reaching out and, and finding out what Local 3 can do for them. You know, um, people, you know, have been hesitant before, and, and I've heard this many a times from you know, people that I've had personal experiences for. I don't know why I didn't call you folks, you know, three years ago, you know, or something like that. I was having, you know, trouble back then, and I, I appreciate all the help you've given me and the people that we've got. So if, if you're out there and you're you're looking to do something different and you want to get with us, uh, call, call your local, you know, hall and get with an organizer, and we'll come out and chat with you for sure. Well, thank you very much, John. Do you have any other parting words? Oh, I think that that's it. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.